morning everyone. Magandang umaga sa ating lahat. And welcome to the 2019 Development Policy Research Month Press Conference. A warm welcome most especially to our friends from the media and to um, the members of the DPRM Steering Committee as well as to those who are watching us live in their homes and offices through our live stream feed. To open our press conference and to give us uh, more details about the TPRM, this year's theme, and our lineup of activities, may I call on the president of the PIDS, Dr. Celia Reyes. Um, to our speakers, uh, representatives of the DPRM steering committee, and members of the media, good morning to you all. Thank you for joining us in the formal opening of the Development Policy Research Month celebration, or the DPRM. Uh, just to give you a brief background, the DPRM is celebrated every September with the Philippine Institute for Development Studies as lead agency. This is pursuant to Presidential Proclamation Number 247, issued in 2002 by then President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. The proclamation underscores the need to promote, enhance, instill, and draw awareness and appreciation of the importance and necessity of policy research in development planning and policy making. Thus, the observance of the DPRM is intended to cultivate a strong culture of research and use of data and evidence among the country's national and local decision makers in policy making and program planning. Every year, we select a theme from an array of current or prospective development issues in the national and global scene. And for this year, the DPRM theme is Navigating the New Globalization, Local Actions for Global Challenges, or in Filipino, Paglalayag sa Bagong Globalisasyon, Lokal na Pagkilo sa Mga Pandaigdigang Hamon. So why did we choose this theme? We're quite familiar with globalization, but the latest buzzword at the World Economic Forum this year is Globalization 4.0. According to the World Economic Forum, we are transitioning into a new phase of globalization, which is characterized by volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, or VUCA in short. Thus, we need to stimulate awareness about this new phenomenon which we coined as the new globalization. The challenges of the new globalization include trade wars, environmental degradation, cross-border public health threats, worsening inequality, erosion of social cohesion and trust, and proliferation of disinformation. If these are not, if these are not managed well, they can undermine the ability of the Philippines to sustain its rapid economic growth and attain its long-term development vision of a matatag, maginhawa, at panatag na buhay para sa lahat, as summarized in the ambition natin 2040, as well as its targets under the Sustainable Development Goals. So we would like to encourage all sectors to get involved and support the government in addressing the challenges posed by the new globalization. The government cannot do it alone. We need the full support and cooperation of our partners from the media, private sector, academe, and civil society. Each of us can do something to mitigate the risk and at the same time, harness the opportunities that come along with the new globalization. This morning, we invited various speakers from government to shed light on how the new globalization can affect key sectors in our society. To set the tone, we will start with the presentation of PIDS Senior Research Fellow, Ruel Briones, on the implications of the new globalization in the Philippines. Our panelists from the Department of Health will tackle immunization and other public health issues and how to address them, while Undersecretary Sasendon Silio from the DILG will discuss about the role of local governments in the new globalization. Our speaker from the DTI, our friend um, Vince Kia, Akia, will talk about how we can enhance the participation of the Philippines in global value chains 
and take advantage of trade wars that are happening now. We hope that through their discussions, we'll be able to understand the different facets of new globalization and use them to our advantage. Let me also take this opportunity to thank the permanent members of the DPRM Steering Committee, such as the National Economic and Development Authority, Civil Service Commission, Philippine Information Agency, Banco Central ng Pilipinas, the ILG, and Presidential Management Staff. This year, we expanded the permanent membership of the DPRM to include the Senate Economic Planning Office, Congressional Policy and, ba and Budget Management, uh, Budget Research Department, and the Department of Budget and Management. We also wish to convey our gratitude to the DPRM additional members this year, such as the Department of Health, DTI Bureau of International Trade Relations, Department of Labor and Employment, uh, Department of Foreign Affairs, specifically the Office of the Undersecretary for International Economic Relations, and the Climate Change Commission. We're also grateful to our sponsors for their huge support in this year's DPRM activities. They are the Philippine Competition Commission, Banco Central ng Pilipinas, NEDA, the ILG, Asian Development Bank, DTI, Department of Foreign Affairs, um, in particular, as I mentioned, the FA AWARE, and the Australian Government's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Allow me also to thank our hardworking Research Information Department, led by Dr. Sheila Siar, for spearheading our DPRM activities. Today's press conference is just one of the series of activities we have lined up this September. We have the Mindanao Policy Research Forum, which is happening next week, September 10, in General Santos City. This is in partnership with the Mindanao Development Authority and the Mindanao State University in Jensan. We also have our main and culminating activity, the annual public policy conference, which will be held on September 19 at Sofitel, Philippine Plaza, Manila. A one-day exhibit will run alongside the APPC that will feature the knowledge products of the event's sponsors. We will be glad to have you cover the APPC on, on September 19. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, but before we start with the discussion of our panelists, we'd like to show you our video on the DPRM. Thank you. Policies can either make or break a country and its people. Hence, they should be thoroughly studied and evaluated. This is where policy research comes in. Through Malacanang Proclamation 247 in 2002, the government declared the month of September as Development Policy Research Month, or DPRM. The DPRM aims to promote nationwide awareness on the importance of policy research in the formulation of evidence-based policies, plans, and programs. It also aims to cultivate a strong culture of research and research use among decision makers and raise the public's literacy on socioeconomic issues. The proclamation also designated the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, to oversee and coordinate all activities related to the DPRM. Every year, the DPRM focuses on a particular theme. Various activities such as policy forums, press conferences, social media promotion, and the annual public policy conference are organized by PIDS and its partners to discuss the DPRM theme. For over a decade, the DPRM has focused on urgent and emerging development issues on food security, health, labor and education, decentralization, resilience, and technology and innovation. This year, the DPRM centers on the theme Navigating the New Globalization, Local Actions for Global Challenges. This is to promote awareness and deeper understanding of the changing face of globalization and the challenges that come along with it, notably the issues of worsening poverty and inequality, exacerbation of environmental degradation, trade wars, widening polarization, and proliferation of disinformation. By focusing on this theme, PIDS and its partners intend to encourage policymakers and the public at large to be proactive both in dealing with these challenges as well as in harnessing the opportunities of the new globalization. 
Everyone has a role to play in shaping the future of the Philippines amid the changing face of globalization. Local actions, enhanced by cross-sectoral collaboration and a whole-of-nation approach, and guided by policy research and the shared vision of prosperity, inclusivity, social cohesion, and resilience, are what we need to help the country harness the opportunities and mitigate the risks emerging from the new globalization. Visit the DPRM website for more information. Before we proceed to the presentation of our panelists, allow us to thank the following uh, media networks for their uh, presence today. Business Mirror, Central News Agency, Malaya Business Insight, Manila Shinbun, Philippine Star, Philippine News Agency, PTB4, TET Business Tribune, Vera Files, ABS-CBN, DZMM, PBS RTVM, Manila Times, DWOKFM, DZMJ, Radio Pilipinas, The Philippine Event News, Saksi, and the Dryong Tagalog. Thank you very much for your support. So what is the new globalization and how is it different from the past waves of globalization? What is implications for the Philippines? This will be answered by our uh, presenter, Dr. Ro Roelano Briones, who is a senior research fellow of uh, PIDS. Dr. Briones conducts policy research for the Philippine government, particularly in agricultural policy. He has authored numerous published research papers and co-edited four books on the economics of agriculture and natural resources, rural development, food security, international trade, and the macroeconomy. Our presenter has also provided technical assistance to government agencies in um, different countries in the ASEAN and also uh, provided um, his expertise uh, for various international donor agencies. Previously, he was assistant professor at the Ateneo Manila University and the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Friends, to present on understanding the new globalization implications for the Philippines, I now give you Dr. Roelano Briones. Thanks, Sheila. Good morning. So let, let me take off on Sheila's uh, question. No? Uh, what do we think about when we hear the term globalization? Maybe this is something that happened a few years before I was born. Uh, all of a sudden, suddenly before people were local, now they're global. Maybe that's one idea. Or maybe this is something that has been happening for many, many decades or even centuries, gradually increasing and putting together our world. Turns out that uh, it's neither of those two. Well, it's somewhere like that. No? Next, please. Uh, oh, no, I have the control. There are actually several waves of globalization. Okay? Ngayon lang kaya, may hula kayo kung ilang wave. Apat, lima, anim, pito, tatlo. Okay, may nagsabi four because they read ahead. <laughs> All the way back to the 19th century was the first wave. So yung globalization, hindi bagong-bago yan. Mga isang siglo nang nakakahigit, Nagkaroon na ng globalization. Kasi dito lang nang nag-connect-connect yung mundo through new technologies such as steamships. Dati, hangin lang ang paglalayag sa, sa karagatan. Pero ngayon, yeah, they, they had the, the able, able to harness fossil fuels, coal. Uh, before, uh, they just needed the horse. Now they could ride an iron horse called the, uh, the train on railways. So even in the statistics at the time, if you look at the share of world trade in gross domestic product of countries at the time, the estimate is about 6% at the beginning of the 19th century. By the eve of World War II, uh, World War I, it became 14%. So medyo mahabang panahon, pero that's more than double of the share. Of course, we know what happened, no? World War I, and then the Great Depression in the late 20s and 30s. And then that was also punctuated by another uh, global war. 
After that war came the second wave. Hmm? Sorry. Anong wala? Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> okay. oh, the second wave of globalization. So in 1945, at the end of that war, uh, you, you saw that people, uh, the nations had retreated from trading kasi nga may mga blockades left and right because they're in the middle of a war. But now when that blockade was over, then they started trading again. Now there was also another version of war, not a hot war, a cold war. Pero despite that, tuloy-tuloy pa rin yung globalization. Nagkaroon ng rebuilding of the international community. Bakit? Natroma na eh. Ah, kung wala pala tayong international community, baka mag-World War III. Eh, mas malala ngayon. May mga nuclear weapons tayo. So, definitely there was that big push of uh, rebuilding the international community. Nagkaroon pa ng bagong technology. Because of the war, anong natutunan ng mundo? O pwede palang gamitin yung aeroplano pang gera. Okay? Tapos, nung tapos na yung gera, ah, pwede palang gamitin yung aeroplano pang transport ng goods at ng people. So, they, we went beyond the ships, we went beyond the railroads, we went beyond even the cars, although the cars, of course, developed very rapidly uh, immediately after the war. And then came the third wave. So, approximately, this came, siguro we can time it with the end of the Soviet Union, where the Cold War ended, and then there was this sense na, Oh, this world of controlling markets, preventing integration, uh, uh, applying all of these controls on capital, on investment, and on trade, that's already passe, okay? The world that is opposing markets, it collapsed, meaning the, the communists, no? the communism, the, the worldwide movement, with the fall of the Soviet Union. No mid-90s was the establishment of the World Trade Organization. And we, we also had, of course, uh, coinciding with that, the increasing adoption of digital technologies, information communication technologies, the rise of the internet, all the more. Now you can get information freely across borders with no hassle. Before, ano yan, may mail mo pa, di ba? Snail mail, kung naalala pa natin. Okay, or you get ship uh, brochures. Now that, imagine how, what kind of world we have if, if that were still the case, no? So while that was happened, uh, the, the, we had the fastest growth of world trade during that time. So nakita natin 14%, then counting increase. Now, by, the, by 2000, half of world GDP, uh, the, the share of world trade in GDP is now about half. Meanwhile, a lot of that trade, when we think of trade, ah, nagtitrade ng TV, nagsiship ng cars. Actually, hindi yung, yun ang pinakausong trade. One fifth of trade is in intermediate goods. We don't ship cars. We ship, we manufacture parts of cars in some places. Okay, ship other uh, parts from place to place, add more components, and finally, in one final point, let's say in Nam uh, uh, in Thailand, finally we assemble the car. But the parts, some of them came from Philippines, some of them came from Taiwan, some of them came from Vietnam, and so on. So this is called the global value chain. All right. Coinciding in that period was an unprecedented fall in poverty. From 4 to 1% uh, in in, at the uh, beginning of the 80s, by 2005, half na lang yon, 20%. So that was a huge, uh, possibly no other event in human, or no other decades in human history has there been such reduction of suffering because of material deprivation ever. These were really historic decades for humanity. So of course, uh, uh, beating chest, yun democracy, the, the liberal values of the West, capitalism, liberalism. In fact, there was one famous political scientist, if you recall the name Francis Fukuyama, sabi nga niya, ang yabang yabang pa, the end of history. And the last man, the last man, for heaven's sake, that was in the early 80s. But, hello. There is now a rude awakening. That world seems to be, oh, parang we now look at that world with some nostalgia when the world was still very gung-ho, very looking forward to further progress than WTO. Ano nangyari sa WTO? Since 1995, walang major new round of negotiations that were ever approved. Okay? World trade growth, 50% na. Nag-grow pa rin, pero much, much slower rate than in the previous decades. 
yes, there was a digital revolution in the third wave. In the fourth wave, we also have an, a new industrial revolution. We call fourth industrial revolution. However, now we are seeing the potential uh, backlash in terms of rapid and unpredictable effects on occupations, jobs, massive job displacement, maraming fear about that, uh, massive reevaluation of what skills really matter, instead of say content oriented education, parang mas maganda ngayon yung competency based education. All of these things is because of, of uh, that uh, fourth in the, the new nature of digital technologies, as well as new ways of interacting. Uh, uh, very interesting now when you see people uh, congregate. Do, they, do you see them talking? Well, nice if you see them talking, but very often they whip out their cell phones and then they <laughs> commune with their cell phones. So that's the world today, new, mo new forms of social interaction. Tapos, that they, oh yes, yes, integration, globalization. Ngayon, iba na ang sagot or um, tuntinig ng mga uh, tao, no? Uh, tinatagulad nila ngayon, nationalism. Yung mga leaders talking tough and taking the nationalist rhetoric, they're the ones becoming presidents and taking power. So, in fact, that has, that's, not a non that's not a trivial development in the world. It might affect the way we cooperate across nations. For instance, the way we have uh, cooperated in terms of climate change. So, the number two uh, emitter of greenhouse gases pulled out of the one single international agreement precisely to combat uh, the, the emission, the free emission of greenhouse gases, which is the Paris Declaration. So, this is really troublesome. Diseases are no longer, ah, sakit lang ng gana yan, sakit lang ng Ebola, dyan lang yan. The world is now globalized, so are diseases globalized. And before, we said, okay, uh, we can deal with that, we have technology for that. Actually, there's a terrifying prospect of new diseases combined also with climate change, no? Plus the fact that we might actually be losing the war, the, the arms race with germs as we develop more and more bacteria fighting drugs, they're actually evolving faster to resist those drugs. The one I told you about, uh, the social interaction. It turns out that, yes, the internet, the, the smartphone are wonderful ways to uh, distribute information. Now you can shop <laughs> online, never having to step inside a retail store. But it also gives you unlimited access to what? Racist uh, material, uh, misogynistic material. All forms of hate now become mainstream. Anybody can access, young people can access. Uh, Islamic extremism, they can access those websites. They can get recruited in those movements. So this is really, uh, really something that is very uh, troublesome. All right, so when you look at how the Philippines started, you know, the foundations of its growth, its adoption of new policies, opening up its economy, this assumed the world of the third wave, diba? Right? That's the time around the time that we went back to our, uh, democratic institutions. However, is it still current given new conditions? What are the new conditions of the new globalization? So, nabanggit ni, uh, sa opening remarks ni President Reyes, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. There are four major features that allow us to state why this is a new globalization. Global trade, which was going one way, especially in the third wave, is now undergoing a restructuring. I'll be describing what that means. Inequality, so before there was a triumphal communism, all we need to do, a triumph over communism and globalization, all we need to do is more integration, then uh, we'll be a more equal world. Turns out that we're questioning that because there are now inequality trends that are worsening. Provision of international cooperation in global public goods, this is now being challenged. I already alluded to this. Plus, among ourselves, the interaction, uh, especially under the impact of these new social media and technologies, there's a weakening of social cohesion and trust, especially, and also as well, the rise of populist movements. Okay, let's go through these quickly. In trade restructuring, you see, can see there that collapse, as I said, the, this is the share of uh, exports to GDP. This is for the uh, world, you can see, it was increasing until that financial crisis and decline, okay, as a share. Philippines, ganun din, actually, medyo stable tayo. Dito tayo nag-shoot up. 
nung third, wor third wave of globalization. And then it collapsed then, <laughs> yung ating share of exports to GDP. Uh, there's also the rise of trade in intermediate goods uh, along those lines uh, I mentioned a while ago. But uh, together with this decline in trade cost, which was a driver, especially the third wave of globalization. Um, now, in addition, in addition to trade in goods, this is trade cost, there's also that um, conver um, increasing role of services in world trade. Before, we also often said, oh, services in the trade yan, haircuts. You have to go to the barber shop to get the haircuts. Turns out that many services can be traded. Plus, you can travel to another place to get cheaper haircuts, right? So there's that uh, trade in services that is becoming increasingly in important. With the fourth industrial revolution, global value chains are now also changing. Some positive effects, some negative effects. Uh, before, you have to produce things in one place, move it to another place, add more components to another place, more components. But now, with 3D printing, you can uh, go back again to producing it in one place, one place where the computer prints the entire uh, thing that you're making. Now, on the other hand, so that's a negative effect. On the other hand, with the Internet of Things, you can now make a more seamless connection of your logistics and your trade transactions. So that's a positive for the formation of global value chains. With digitalization and blockchains, now you can reduce the cost of coordination. For instance, now you can have national single window plus blockchain to easily verify the identity of whoever is claiming to be bringing in or bringing out uh, goods and services across the border, thus automating customs clearance. Uh, you can now have uh, e-commerce platforms, and if you can't understand the, the, uh, the language of the merchant or the buyer, you can have real-time translation now, so that you can uh, understand each other. This was not available uh, be previously. However, there's been another trend against globalization, sorry, against the, the previous structure of world trade in terms of uh, fragmentation of global market cooperation. We have here the trade war. It's, there's one between the China and the US. There's also one between the two big East Asian powerhouses, Korea and Japan, uh, ongoing. Protectionist strategies of countries are now alienating their allies, causing a decline in demand for exports, especially, as I said, between the US and China. And there are now attacks on multilateral institutions. Up to now, I think the United States has not given its vote for judges for the World Trade Organization dispute. So essentially, the dispute settlement process in WTO has been frozen ever since 2016. All right? So of course, there's a silver lining there. It's possible that with this trade war, uh, countries will now move away from China. They may look for other countries as an option, as a destination for their investments or as a source of the goods that they want to buy. Kasi mataas na yung tariff kung manggagaling sa China. Baka pwede ang Pilipinas dyan. Worsening global inequality. So of course, inuans natin ng konti. By some definitions, ang inequality actually pababa na yan. Mostly because two big countries na maraming mahihirap since 1980, yung nabanggit ko kanina, experienced the most rapid reduction in poverty. Talking about China and India. But from another perspective, if you look at uh, the share of the poorest 5% uh, worldwide, although it has increased, uh, the share of the top 1% increased even faster. If you look at, at other measures within, uh, within regions, if you look at the share of, um, okay, so China, this is the slide I mentioned. If you look at um, how much of the growth is captured by income groups, it's quite interesting that in, say, US and Canada, only 2% captured the gain of that growth, but the top 10% per, captured two thirds of that. So if you uh, hear a lot of the uh, complaints about, uh, you know, uh, the markets or the economy has left many Americans behind or many North Americans behind. Yeah, that's one source of their complaints. It's a bit better for country uh, situation in China, but really, really bad in countries like Russia. It's also similar in India uh, as in Canada. Worldwide, that's 57% of the growth was actually captured by the top 10%. 
whereas only 12% of growth worldwide was captured by uh, the bottom 50%. This is um, from this is the trend from 1988 to 2008. Now in the Philippines, we're actually bucking the international trend. We're actually doing better. There has been, interestingly enough, although you may not feel it, based on the statistics, poverty has been falling. Inequality has also been declining. If you look across various shares, the share of the bottom quintile uh, versus the share of the top quintile, or more sophisticated ra ratios like Gini ratio, uh, if you look at the decline in poverty between 2006 and 2015, this is being driven mainly by the movement of workers outside agriculture. Since 2011, there has been a net reduction of workers in agriculture by 1.6 million. 1.6 million workers have left agriculture since 2011. And that has actually led to an improvement in incomes because they've moved to better paying jobs and wages of agriculture that, that remain go up. Although entrepreneurial incomes have actually contributed a negative 15%, so it's not all good news, no? Oh, of course, uh, let's not, <laughs> let's congratulate also government. Government transfers contributed a big share, uh, one half of the decline uh, in, in poverty. Uh, of course, when you think uh, conditional cash transfers, that's part of the story. However, the rate of decline, however much we like to congratulate ourselves, is still slower. So still a lot needs to be done in terms of reduction of poverty. We still have one of the highest measures of inequality in Southeast Asia, despite the gains made in recent decades. Worldwide, the drivers of inequality are actually this globalization I've been talking about. That's why it's so deeply resented. Combined with technological change, again, that is why it's deeply resented. Uh, the relaxation of uh, labor market policies, the relaxation of minimum wages worldwide that has been shown to have a problem in terms of inequality, as well as the globalization of finance and the increasing size and sophistication of the financial sector, especially now there's a worsening digital divide affecting uh, financial services. All right? So challenges to the provision of global public goods. Uh, so these are goods that really need cooperation at the international level in order for us to make a headway. Uh, for example, the environment, as I said, cooperate because the atmosphere doesn't care where the greenhouse gas comes from. U.S., Philippines, it's all the same. It's all our job to prevent these from escaping into the atmosphere. However, that is under threat. Again, the virus doesn't care. <laughs> where it is, no, and if it can escape, doesn't know what the border is. Okay, it will just cross uh, together with whatever is the vector. So we need, of course, uh, um, uh, cooperation in that sense. Also, uh, our international institutions. Okay, uh, again, we needed these to prevent wars and even low-intensity conflicts between countries. But if we, if the respect of the populations of the world are eroded in these institutions. They don't really care no more about the United Nations or even more about regional arrangements. Then how do we settle disputes? Ano, gera na lang kagad? Pwede ba yun? So, um, again, the commitment of uh, finance from, of course, governments in funding these global public goods is now also a problem, okay? Therefore, we've seen ever more precisely when we need these cooperation arrangements, they are now being under-resourced. So this is some uh, evidence from United System uh, expenditures by category. You can see a declining trend across uh, various types of uses, especially since around 2015. Uh, here's as humanitarian. Uh, well, humanitarian is okay, but the others are not really doing well. Technical cooperation, for instance, has declined. Final feature of globalization is building social cohesion and trust. So this is important. This has actually been proven to be economically important. However, uh, if you, this is one evidence why it's important. The countries where you have high trust tend to have also high GDP. Nasa ng Pilipinas dyan? Tayo yata yung di ko makita. So, ba? Ayun. Ano to? Low trust. Me, major, <laughs> major, major GDP. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, that's that sort of 
sort of demonstrates the point, no? Now, what are the factors affecting this social cohesion? So, hindi lang ito just, just a matter of people getting together, interacting with each other. Again, this has economic implications, but this is being undermined um, by uh, factors such as globalization. Previously, we thought globalization being, you know, exposing people to other cultures, other countries, this will be a force for social cohesion. Turns out that when people rub <laughs> shoulders, <coughs> certain kind of people, they don't like what they see. They don't like <laughs> yung pananalita ng tao. They find it very foreign, very alien. It even increases the alienation. So this is the negative force of trust. Technology used to be seen as an enabler of trust because again, you expose, you can see uh, more transparent public transactions. But then again, yeah, you turbocharge the delivery of misinformation through the new technologies. So. This is a vast concern, no? It's somehow overwhelming when we look at it. The problems seem to be impossible, na ilayag. Uh, the seas seem to be so turbulent. So that's why, please come to the public policy conference. We offer local solutions, and we'll give you a taste of what those local solutions might look like with the discussion of the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruel, for your uh, comprehensive presentation. We hope that by now, medyo malino na sa atin kung ano ang ibig sabihin ng new globalization or bagong globalization. So to uh, taking off from um, Ruel's um, penultimate slide, I think, how do we now navigate the troubled seas of globalization? So we have invited a, um, officials of three government agencies to share their insights on how we can mitigate the risk and uh, take advantage of the opportunities posed by the new globalization. And first to share um, her insights is uh, no less than the Under Secretary for uh, Local Government of the Department of the Interior and Local Government. Under Secretary Maribel Sassendoncillo started her career in the ILG as a senior human resource development officer for the local government academy in 1989, occupying positions such as local government operations officer and development management officer along the way. In 1996, she was appointed as the director of the LGA, where she served for more than two decades. She also served as the concurrent regional director of the DILG Region 8, for two years until she was promoted as Assistant Secretary for Local Government last August 2018. Under Secretary Sassendoncillo holds a Master's Degree in Development Management from the Asian Institute of Management and um, she has also received a scholarship to study conflict management and post-conflict recovery at the University of York, United Kingdom through the Shivening Senior Fellowship Program of the British Council. Friends, I now give you Under Secretary Maribel Sassendoncillo to share he, her insights about the role of local governments in uh, providing local actions for global challenges. Maraming salamat. Magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. Good morning. Uh, I would like to thank the PIDS for inviting us this morning to kick off the celebration of the Development Policy Research Month. I know that the primary objective of this month-long event is to promote awareness of how policy research contributes in the formulation of evidence-based plans, programs, and policies. I find it very timely that you chose the theme, navigating the new globalization, local actions for global challenges. Tinagalog ito ni Selye, ang ganda ng pagkakatagalog. Paglalayag sa bagong globalisasyon, lokal na pagkilos sa mga pandaigdigang hamon. Pero ako po'y waray-waray, kaya medyo matigas ang pagka-pronounce. No? Because whether we like it or not, we are part of the bigger system. And with the developments in technology, transportation, and infrastructure, the world has become smaller. Yet, the opportunities brought forth by globalization in terms of trade and technology also entails challenges that, for those who argue against it, led only to a greater divide between the rich and the poor. 
with the growing rate of globalization. Sabi nga ni Dr. Briones, iniquities continue to be more and more apparent. I was talking with Celia, ano na ba sa Pilipinas dati, 80% of our national wealth is controlled by 20% of our population. Parang mas lumaki daw. With iniquities comes discontent which leads to conflicts and threats to security. In these situations, the poor and the marginalized get hit the most as it hampers development. Iniquities continue due to poor governance. That is our thesis. In fact, almost all of the social problems are caused by poor governance at various levels, starting from the global stage, regional, national, and local levels. I would define governance in the past 30 years of my experience with the ILG. I simplified governance as the art and science of managing relationships for results. So what is crucial in governance is be able to manage relationships of people and institutions and people with its environment. These are relationships between and among people anchored on equitable access to resources and opportunities. In the Philippine context, the window of governance are local governments being closest to the people. This was recognized by the enactment of the Local Government Code of 1991 that decentralized powers and responsibilities but 28 years after the enactment of the code, where are we? For 28 years, we have seen LGUs responding to the challenges of local governance, but there are permutations in terms of capacities to govern as you move from one part of the country to the other. For sure, exemplars in local governance and development have emerged, but the challenge continues for the transformation of the whole country from mere islands towards an entire archipelago of good governance. The role of local govern governments is embodied basically in the devolution policy, specifically in section 16 and 17 of the local government code. The SDGs as an example can only be achieved through local action. I hope Everybody will agree with me. SDGs, as I've said, are global commitments that we know can only be achieved with local governments at the forefront. The role in basic service delivery, creating vibrant local economies, developing resilient communities, maintaining peace and security in their localities, and improving the quality of lives of their constituencies are only possible if good local governance prevails. As I mentioned earlier, there are permutations in terms of local government capacities to govern as you move from one part of the country to another. If global challenges would require local actions, then the key is enhancing local governance by way of looking at their capac of the capacities in various pillars of governance. Across these capacity pillars, we encounter that some LGUs are more mature than the others, which ideally should have been basis for the national government in their provision of technical assistance. As early as the late 80s, when the local government code was being crafted by Congress, I was then with the local government academy. Our position then was not to go wholesale in decentralization but go selective decentralization because the transfer of responsibilities to local governments would really require certain levels of capacities. So those that are capable should be given that opportunity already, but those that are not have to be assisted until they reach a stage where they're ready to deliver the service. Unfortunately, Congress wanted it wholesale, so we had decentralization throughout the country, and we've seen the results. Uh, we, we see you know, good ones. We have opportunities that are being captured by local governments with a decentralized system. But we also see communities that remain at the bottom 
because of poor capacities of their local governments. The pillars that I'm talking about would start with structures. And this refers to the presence of appropriate structures, the offices, the committees, the work groups, with defined authority and accountability for performing the necessary functions within a program. Competency would be another pillar that would refer to knowledge and skills of people who need to perform the assigned functions in the program. The management systems is also a big pillar that refers to systems, processes, and procedures for managing programs in the local government. Enabling policies would also be a strong pillar. And this refers to the presence of policy and legislative support for planning, developing, implementing, monitoring, and evaluating service delivery functions, programs, and projects. Knowledge and learning is also an important pillar. And this would refer to mechanisms for generating, analyzing, and using data and information as basis for decision making and continuous improvement. The work that the ILG has done with um, Celius Group, the CBMS, has created a lot of wonders in local governments. So we now see local governments looking at specific data in crafter, crafting their plans, deciding on certain actions, and where to invest. Saan sila mag invest The CBMS data has been very helpful. And this is now um, complemented with governance audit data. So alam na nila kung saan mahina, saan malakas, therefore, ang decisions as to where they would invest resources of local governments are now based on data. Finally, leadership. And leadership refers to presence of mechanisms for defining their vision, the mission and values, and setting strategic directions. Ensuring transparency and accountability in LGU's operations. Instituting participatory mechanisms beyond just telling people what the LGU is doing, it moves from informing to consultation, coordination, up to empowerment. That, that whole gamut of participation. Establishing partnerships and collaboration. Vertical and horizontal partnerships are needed by local governments. And the visible is sponsorship of programs. We've seen in many local governments, things get moving because you have the mayor championing. No, yung presence mismo ng mayor in these programs are very vital to success of the program. So leadership is key. Uh, we just finished running the orientation for the newly elected officials after the elections. And I was whispering to Celia, sayang hindi umabot yung presentation with Dr. Briones. This should be very important as the local governments define their directions for the term. Malaga po yung, yung input on globalization. Good governance may seem simple in concept. But as defined earlier, it becomes more difficult to attain due to the challenges in managing relationships for results. Some of the vertical challenges, incomplete devolution, the local government code should have been amended after five years, as the law provided. But it was never subjected to these amendments. May mga papichi-pichi lang na amendments, but it was not really an omnibus amendment. So the devolution until now, after 28 years, is, is not completed. Even if there is acknowledgment that results are generated on the ground, the control of resources decision-making still rests in the higher level of government, with national government. So until now, makikita po natin, marami pa rin basic services that are done directly by national agencies. They are not given to local governments. Primarily, control of resources. Landum pa rin sa national government. However, we have to provide the environment for local governments to take local actions and maximize results. Another challenge is weak accountability mechanisms. While we exact compliance, and we have been strongly and more aggressively doing this in this administration, we exact compliance from local governments, we do not find it prevailing among national agencies. And deep-seated corruption is another challenge. 
So kung yung mayor, dumadaan kahit ano pa yung itsura ng ating election process, after three years, papasok sila sa election, dadaan sila sa evaluation ng kanilang constituencies. But we do not see that happening among national agencies. What is prevailing now is the accountability of national agencies is to the top. We follow the mandates of headquarters rather than looking at accountability from the ground. And the most difficult to deal with of all is the prevailing behavior of government to operate in silos, attitudinal or behavioral silos. So we, this administration had been campaigning for a whole of government, whole of nation approach. I just had a meeting with Secretary Anu yesterday. We're into a program uh, if you are familiar with Executive Order 70, ending the local communist armed conflict, which would require a whole of nation approach, and I told him, sir, that requires convergence of various agencies, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that it cannot happen overnight with my 30 years in government service. It cannot happen overnight because of the attitudinal silos prevailing in government. How can the local governments, for example, address the SDGs on the ground if the bureaucracy at the national level have been working independently of each other, working at different targets, prioritizing different areas, and implementing duplicating programs and the like? For simply speaking, the government should be accountable to the Filipino people, to every Juan and Juana. In, the, in like manner, every citizen of the country must not only demand rights, but take responsibilities. What prevails now in the country is apathy, where people are not just concerned. Walang pakialam kung ano yung nangyayari. No. As we all know, there's a saying, bad people continue because good people just allow them to do it. No? Pinababayaan natin. But this apathy may also be attributed to poor governance. The people become apathetic because they do not see results. Self-interest, corruption, apathy, at pagkakanya-kanya, these are just some of the socio-cultural factors that, sorry, that likely to have contributed to the lagging development in our country. Factors that led to poor, misallocation or non-allocation of what resources we have that's supposed to have been used for projects that benefit the people. Which brings me to the core of it all, a kind of panacea, if you must, that only if the national and all local governments adhere to and practice its concepts and guiding principles, most of our social problems could probably have been addressed by now through good governance by demonstrating that the rule of law prevails in their localities, that the underprivileged and most vulnerable are protected, and that laws are impartially enforced through transparency and accountability in administration and financial transactions, by ensuring efficiency and effectiveness in its processes and institutions, good governance enables the local government to engage with their constituents based on trust. And I'm happy that it was, it was part of the analysis of Dr. Briunes. Trust becomes now a challenge. And with the trust in government regained, good governance allows for the most innovative solutions to emerge through continuous dialogue and increased inclusivity among community members. The diverse motivations and capabilities are harnessed for the best interest of the whole community. Good governance provides spaces for people to participate in defining what development means, in planning for how they will attain it, and perhaps even in implementing and evaluating whether what they did led to positive impacts in their lives. This, in turn, ensures that the programs offered by local governments are responsive and really reflect what the people desire. Though there are participatory monitoring mechanisms in place, there's still a lot more to work on that the LGUs can implement in their localities. Perhaps more applicable 
will still be the face-to-face -face dialogues and consultations with the community members that we can look forward to. The use of social media can help, can help in communicating with their communities, with their constituencies. So marami pa po ang kailangan gawin. If we anchor our capacity to respond to the challenges of globalization on local governments, there's still a lot more to do with local governments. Essentially, I repeat, the role of the local governments is to manage relationships for results. And good and meaningful relationships are founded on one's ability to listen, listen to their constituencies, their peers, their superiors, their partners, and all members of the human ecology that they call their area of responsibility. But what could complement this capacity to listen is also looking forward and looking outside at opportunities and challenges that may affect the lives of local communities. And the challenges of globalization is a must for local governments to understand. Thank you very much and good morning. Maraming pong salamat, ma'am. You sex sa Sendon Silio for your uh, thought-provoking um, insights and your um, candid assessment of governance issues sa ating bansa, as well as uh, emphasizing the importance of good governance among our local governments in order for us to address the challenges of the new globalization. Our next speaker will talk about enhancing the Philippines' participation in global value chains and capitalizing on the trade wars. She is Ms. Marie Sherilyn Delinia Akia, who is the chief of the Multilateral Relations Division of the Bureau of International Trade Relations, Department of Trade and Industry. Ms. Akia also heads the APEC and WTO desk, and she has served as DTI's coordinator for substantive issues during the APEC 2015 chairmanship of the Philippines. She also worked as desk officer for the WTO in charge of the Philippines trade policy review, trade remedies, investment and competition policy issues. And she, uh, she also assisted uh, during the negotiations of the ASEAN-Japan Comprehensive Economic Partnership. While serving at the department, she was seconded to the National Competitiveness Council as special assistant of the NCC co-chairperson for the private sector Friends, I now give you Ms. Marie Sherilyn Delinia Akia of uh, the Department of Trade Industry Bureau of International Trade Relations. Thank you very much and good morning everyone. First, let me start by thanking the PIDS, Dr. Reyes, for inviting the Department of Trade and Industry. Uh, the, uh, the PIDS, as everyone knows, they are our partner in policy making, especially with their researches and policy briefs. Um, my presentation will focus, uh, in a way, on what the department is doing to navigate the new globalization, given the different uh, developments. I think it was pointed out in the earlier slides, namely on the trade wars and also the changes in the role of GVCs in trade. So let me start by showing you some slides. So we uh, prepared this uh, particular slide uh, to show that at least in, in this year, mid-year, total external trade uh, in goods amounted to 86.9 billion reflecting a slight decrease of 0.5% from 87.4 billion external trade in the same period of the previous year. Figure one, also, uh, figure one below shows a declining Philippine trade deficit from July 2018 to April 2019. And the Philippines has started gaining trade surplus since April 2019. Um, actually, the trade deficit is a uh, a big concern of the department. Uh, it has ballooned uh, from 
6.9 billion US dollars in um, 2010 to 47.55 in 2018. So this is a co deep concern for us and uh, the countries that have contributed to this uh, trade deficit are China, Korea, Indonesia, and Thailand. This slide shows uh, you uh, the situation, trade situation in terms of imports, uh, where you'll see that there's increase annually from 2014 to 2018, resulting to compounding trade deficit. Um, a lot of them because of our imports of uh, automobiles uh, and other uh, intermediate goods. Philippine exports shows minimal but stable growth. Our top export markets, as you can see from this uh, slide, are China, including Hong Kong, the United States, uh, Japan, Singapore, Thailand, Korea, Germany, Netherlands, Taiwan, Malaysia. Key exports of the Philippines are mostly electronics, at least more than half of our exports are electronic products, and the other half uh, are non-electronic products. This earlier slide shows you also our top three trading partners, and from 2014 to 2018, our exports to Japan has decreased by 25.7%. Our exports to, to the U.S. increased by 23%, and our exports to China increased by 4.12%. In terms of imports from 2014 to 2018, our imports from China increased by 123%. Our imports from Japan increased by 105%, our in, and our imports from the U.S. increased by 40.5%. Miss Miss, or the micro, small, and medium enterprises are very important to us. Uh, the department views them as, the, as critical in terms of driving economic growth, trade, employment, poverty alleviation, and innovation. The government, uh, through the department, has implemented many initiatives to promote their innovation, their growth, competitive, competitiveness, and sustainability. The government is also trying its best to increase the number of MISMIS to develop and facilitate their growth and transform them into global suppliers, mainly to take advantage not, all, not only to sell to our, uh, to our domestic market, but also to reach out uh, and expand to the greater market, including on the 10-member ASEAN and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So that covers like 620 million in terms of population. So I will walk you through uh, some of the initiatives that the government have undertaken in order to improve our MISMIS and improve them as contributors to global value chains. So in terms of uh, the domestic uh, initiatives, we have uh, the Philippine Development Plan, and under the Philippine Development Plan uh, are a number of initiatives, such as the Blueprint for Decent Employment and Entrepreneurship. Uh, in 2017, the, the department reaped the breakthroughs from its adoption in the previous year, and the plan is to set 7.5 million jobs in key employment generating sectors, such as manufacturing. We are also uh, implementing uh, the 2017 Investments Priority Plan, which identifies priority sectors uh, wherein the, uh, the government will provide fiscal support to strengthen the manufacturing resurgence plan through business matching of Filipino and foreign investors. Uh, under, under this is a list of priority investment activities to be given incentives, including manufacturing activities such as agri-processing, agriculture, and fishery, among others. We are also implementing the 
IQS or the Inclusive Innovation Industrial Strategy. Uh, we're in the government uh, is aiming to upgrade manufacturing, agriculture, and services uh, while strengthening our mismatch linkages into domestic and global value chain. The goal is really to develop globally competitive and innovative industries with a strong forward and backward linkages and address the most binding constraints that prevent the entry of new firms or hinder their integration into GVCs of multinationals. La, in two years ago, uh, the second manufacturing summit brought together more than 250 stakeholders from private sectors, in, including industry associations, business chambers, academia and research community. And taking off from the manufacturing summit focus on trabajo at negocio for inclusive growth, a second summit, uh, the second summit highlighted the accomplishment of DTI's manufacturing resurgence plan and the new industrial policy known as the IQS. So it covers 12 priority industries that cover the automotive and auto parts, aerospace parts, agribusiness, chemicals, construction, tourism, transport and logistics, and so on. So it covers both goods and services, as you've seen in the earlier slide of Dr. Bionis. Uh, the role of services is very important in trade. I mean, we just see maybe yung goods in terms of the statistics, but we do not see yung role ng services because it's embedded in the development of these goods. Yung, yung like for example, research and development, advertising, even human resource, that is part and parcel of the goods that we are exp uh, exporting. So the department is, really, is also focusing uh, on the services part. I already mentioned the manufacturing resurgence program and uh, uh, and parts of the IQS, which is under the inclusive Philippine Philippine innovation and entrepreneurship roadmap. We also have the Ripples or uh, the regional interactive platform for Philippine exporters, which is an important uh, activity of uh, initiative of the department. The Ripples. Uh, to look at my código. <laughs> okay. okay, we can go back to this maya maya. Essentially, what we are showing is that it is a good time to be a Miss Me because we have a lot of uh, initiatives uh, to focus on their uh, competitiveness, to improve their innovation and also to improve their standards. I think what we're really building are global mismis in order for them to compete domestically kasi we're opening up our market so may mga dumadating na mga foreign mga foreign sellers and uh, and uh, a lot of competition so we need to prop our own mismis so they can compete. And at the same time we're also preparing them to compete globally. So we have also the micro, small, and medium enterprise development plan, the Go Negocio Act of 2015, the OTOP or One Town One Product Next Generation, and our shared service facilities or SSF projects. Actually, a lot of these uh, initiatives um, have been going on for a while, even from the previous administration. But you will see from this particular administration, especially under the leadership of Secretary Lopez, there is a very distinct focus on, uh, on the Miss Me agenda. Um, I think from what uh, was also shown earlier, um, there's still a lot that needs to be done. Um, there's still the need to address uh, even with, uh, with the different projects that the DTI have launched, there's still some key, as key constraints for in order for us to attract investments. Um, firstly, there is the uncertainty over the trabajo bill. That's something that we have to address. There's also the shortage of viable locations near the current eco zone clusters. Um, this is important because a lot of our exports are coming from the PESA 
from the economic zones. So there is a need to secure the expansion of eco zones outside of Metro Manila. And then also uh, we have we need to implement properly the ARTA or the Ease of Doing Business Act. So these are some just some of the initiatives that we have launched in the DTI uh, in order for us to uh, take advantage of the trade war. If we do not do anything about the, I mean, if we do not respond properly in government, for sure we will be affected negatively. We need to compete uh, not just uh, among ourselves, among our mismis, but we need to compete with our ASEAN partners. A lot of them are really taking advantage of the trade war. They're in a better position uh, compared to us. Um, the Philippines were not really export oriented. I showed you some some figures earlier. It may sound big, but compared to our ASEAN neighbors, our our uh, our share of trade is may, is way way smaller. So we have to uh, in government, and it's a whole of government approach. We need to be much more pre, uh, proactive in order to take advantage of the uh, this current developments. And it's something that is going to continue. We do not see a uh, lessening of the populist sentiments, a lessening of the trade war. Just over the weekend, the US already implemented additional tariffs to China on um, certain goods such as smartwatches, flat panel TVs, and all. And these are the very same line of products that we export. So we have to be vigilant. We have to be very proactive in government. And it's um, really not just for trade to do, but a whole of government approach. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. So uh, we're done with local governments and then trade. Now we go to health. So uh, one of the risks uh, being posed by uh, a more globalized world is the, um, the ease of transmission of, cross of infectious diseases across borders. And this is compounded by the uh, decrease in immunization rates, the significant immunization gap, which is taking place, happening, which is happening not just in the Philippines, but also in other parts of the world. Um, as well as other public health issues that have arisen as a consequence of um, increasing urbanization. And with us um, this morning is the um, manager of the National Immunization Program. Um, she is uh, Dr. Maria Wilda Silva and she is representing the Undersecretary uh, for the Public Health Services team of the Department of Health, Mir Nakabotahe. Friends, I now give you Dr. Maria Wilda Silva. Thank you very much. Good morning. And in behalf of USEC uh, Mir Nakabotahe of the Public Health Services team, Thank you for inviting us to share our uh, challenges and achievements as well as our future uh, plans to up the immunization coverage, particularly uh, in this challenging world. So I have, a, I have a presentation and it's more focused on immunization because this is uh, our biggest challenge as of now. Uh, we heard the presentation a while ago that the virus will not, cannot identify borders. Although we are in that location we're in, we are in the middle of a body, bodies of water. However, because of ease of travel, I guess, no, uh, you can see in the s slides later on that we have and we are indeed at risk for uh, resurgence of, of, of vaccine preventable disease okay now let me give you a brief introduction on uh, how the expanded program on immunization started it started in 1976 and in this area and this time uh, we only 
have vaccines for six preventable diseases. But then as years go by, we are now enjoying Where are my sources? It's not working. Next, please. Okay. And uh, as of now, we have expanded not just for infant vaccination, from infant vaccination, but we are also covering adolescents, pregnant women, as well as senior citizens. So indeed, we have evolved from six vaccine-preventable diseases just for infants and as of 2019, we are now providing vaccines to senior citizens as well. Now, EPL milestones, and this is uh, two of the uh, proof that indeed vaccines work. Because in the year 2000, the Philippines was declared polio-free and still enjoying the polio-free status as of present. And also in uh, and also in November 2017, after years of working for maternal and maternal and neonatal tetanus elimination, we were the 44th country to have achieved the maternal and neonatal tetanus elimination in November 2017. So these are the milestones in the expanded program on immunization. We are working for elimination of several diseases as well, one of which is measles, congenital rubella, Japanese encephalitis, and uh, also uh, the achievement of a low zero prevalence for hepatitis B. But then you all know that uh, we need to give a child complete sets of vaccines to be fully protected. And you can see in this graph that from 2011 up to 2019, the fully immunized children proportion has been declining. Therefore, in 2018 and 2019, especially in the first two months of 2019, January and February, we experienced missiles outbreak. And it is a very big outbreak. We are still in outbreak or epidemic level up to now for missiles. We haven't fully controlled the transmission of missiles. Despite uh, the effort of the government to give the second dose of missiles containing vaccine, not just to infants, but we have extended this to school children up to grade seven. And you can see here in a slide, uh, this is from a World Health Organization, that in 2014, this was an outbreak which we had before the outbreak in 2018 and 2019. 2015 to 2017, uh, missiles cases are controlled. But uh, a very big outbreak in the Philippines in 2014, this one was presented to us by World Health Organization that indeed, it is not only uh, you know, commodities that we export according to this picture, but also missiles virus as well. So uh, this was shown when I attended a missiles uh, conference uh, in, 24, in 2014. And uh, uh, yeah, we exported a lot of missiles viruses all over the world. 2014. Because uh, this is, this is uh, monitored by international health regulation because aside from diseases of uh, international health, international uh, uh, public health uh, event of international concern, missiles is one of the things or the diseases that they are monitoring. Now, 
Another challenge that we are experiencing now, uh, if uh, you you heard the news or, or you watch or you listen to the news last night or, or two days ago, is the risk for polio recirculation. I have mentioned that we have eliminated polio in year 2000. Our last case was uh, seen in 1993 in Cebu wherein we saw a, a child paralyzed because of uh, polio virus. And to, we were declared to have eliminated polio in 2000. We are still enjoying that status. However, the risk for polio recirculation is real. Uh, this press release came out September 2, 2019, and a press conference was also conducted wherein the secretary, when the Secretary of Health announced that in the environment, we found several samples of polio-like uh, virus or vaccine-derived polio virus. So we are now on high alert for polio recirculation thus we are doing some campaigns to arrest or to stop transmission of polio now vaccine confidence in the philippines plummeted this is a study or a survey conducted by the uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine comparing vaccine confidence 2015 versus 2018. So the vaccine confidence issue came about after the announcement of one company about the deng dengue vaccine that we have uh, implemented, dengue vaccination that we have implemented in 2016. And uh, before we can uh, come up with a statement on the safety of the vaccine, actually, the social media was very active because I, I think this was announced in, in, in Europe or in France one day before we had the the actual or the official communication from WHO. So, naunahan po nila kami. Nauna na po yung balita. That's how uh, the, the news is spread. That's how fast the news is spread. Uh, by social media, before we got the official communication, the, the news about the dengue vaccine has uh, circulated widely already. And this is and this is uh, the result of the vaccine confidence survey. From 93% to 32%, people agreeing that vaccines are important. A lot of people now don't think that vaccines are important. 21% agree that vaccines are safe. So majority, more than 50%, think that vaccine is not safe and also confidence in the effectiveness of vaccine also plummeted from 82% to 22%. This is actually the very big challenge of the Department of Health, how to bring back uh, vaccine confidence or the trust of the public to vaccine safety and efficacy again. So, we experienced an outbreak in 2018 and early part of 2019. And as I have said, for missiles, the, the fight is not yet over. We haven't controlled missiles transmission. We are still a little above the epidemic uh, or outbreak threshold. And uh, the threat of polio recirculation is just at bay. So it is a wake-up call that amidst the controversies, the hysteria, the chaos, and then the outbreaks. So it's a wake-up call. What is the way forward now? This is, this is the Formula One Plus for Health. And the vision of the Department of Health where we want all Filipinos to be the healthiest among Asia. 
in 22. 2022. See, go on. And our vision is to lead the country in the development of a people-centered, resilient, and equitable health system. We do have strategic focus, and these are to institutionalize a people-centered service de delivery network, lead a whole of society collaboration at all levels to help people live healthy, and also strategic pillars of financing where we okay financing ensure availability of essential and quality service regulation and uh, yeah, go on. regulation and yes go on Okay. and governance. These are the four pillars of the Formula One Plus for Health, wherein this is our guiding principle in the Department of Health. Of course, the overarching there is performance accountability, wherein every employee of the Department of Health should have the accountability in all of the programs towards the achievement of the vision and mission of the Department of Health. We also have our, next. So we also have our universal health care law that was recently signed. As the secretary mentioned time and again, this is a landmark law that will ensure quality services to be afforded to all Filipinos. The basic essential quality services will be afforded to make the Filipinos the healthiest towards the vision of the Department of Health to make the Filipinos the healthiest among Asia by 2020. And the Secretary also mentions time and again that immunization is one of the core programs under the, the universal health care. So the policy directions of the immunization program will go beyond the existing antigens. We are not just providing antigens now for diseases that are endemic in the Philippines, but we are also prepositioning antigens or vaccines for possible global pandemic. Again, we have a threat for global influenza, pandemic influenza, and that is now what the EPI program is trying to plan for. Another population group considered equally susceptible and vulnerable like the adolescent, senior citizens, and other special groups will also be targeted. We have started to give immunization to adolescents, pregnant women, and also the senior citizens. But this is not yet universal, meaning it's just the poorest of the poor among senior citizens. And for school-based vaccination uh, program providing booster doses to adolescents, school children, these are just offered in public schools, not considering or not including the out-of-school youth as, as well as those learners enrolled in the, pub, in the private schools. Coverage of newly introduced, uh, introduced vaccines will be scaled up nationwide uh, because of prices or cost of new vaccines in the market. Yeah. This is actually what is prohibiting the government in giving several more vaccines that will address vaccine preventable diseases. Government, part, government sectors have been giving rotavirus for so long to address rotavirus diarrhea among children, which is actually more than 70% of the causes of diarrhea of, uh, for children is secondary to this virus, rotavirus. The, the, the private sector has been giving this for several times, but then because of the prohibitive cost of new vaccines, this is what is limiting the government. 
achievement of the Philippines government commitment to international immunization goals, like accelerated control of missiles and rubella, other countries have eliminated this. Uh, the Americas, as well as the, the, the European regions, have eliminated missiles. Some countries in the Western Pacific region, like China, and Japan have declared elimination of missiles. But then because of globalization, because of travel, easy, easy entry and exit from one part of the country to, to other parts, uh, to other countries, then uh, spread of disease uh, knows no boundary. Now, we want to uh, achieve our commitment to international immunization goals. We want to lower down the incidence of hepatitis B. We also committed to decrease the incidence of rubella or German missiles. Other diseases are also in the pipeline to be eliminated. However, because of uh, uh, number one is uh, vaccine hesitancy, which brought about by news, whether it's fake news or we are not just uh, well understood, then this really impacted our service delivery of the universal immunization for all infants. We also want to address VPDs or the vaccine preventable disease. And how do we do this? We want to increase our surveillance, not just in the city, but also our borders, our ports, our airports. So this uh, calls for collaboration among agencies, among other uh, agencies and partners, like the Bureau of Quarantine, the Bureau of Customs, because they can guard our ports and uh, report to us the, the incidence of uh, vaccine preventable diseases. Now, key to success is, of course, buy-in from local chief executives. You know we have a devolved health delivery system, wherein the national makes the policy, provides technical assistance, provides the commodities. But the implementers are the local government units. That's why we partner with the local government unit. They are the ones providing the services to the clients. Our clients in the Department of Health are the regions as well as the local government units. Our clients are not the patients themselves because we just provide commodities and we provide the policies to move the commodities. But then the services are provided by the local government units. That's why partnership, strong partnership, and strong or a buy-in from the local chief executives and all of the implementers is critical to achieve the success that we want to see in the immunization program and all of the DOH program. We want evidence-based target setting and planning. So this is where data gathering, timely reporting, timely feedback is very essential. Why? Because when we do plan in the national level without the inputs from the implementers on the ground, then our target m might be off, far off from what is really happening or needed in the field. Strong social mobilization activities, like what the, s the secretary frequently mentions, the DOH cannot do it alone. Make immunization your conversation piece because you know immunization program is also a victim of its own success in the past we are not seeing vaccine preventable diseases like diphtheria like pertussis missiles have been forgotten for a while because of all these successes you know parents our clients have forgotten that this diseases exist 
and when we are confronted with several or very few uh, cases, then they will, they will not mind because they think they will not be affected. Here comes an outbreak, then everybody gets alarmed. So strong social mobilization activities uh, make immunization your conversation piece. We shouldn't be complacent that diseases were no, are no longer seen. Now, very important again is adequate operational funds. The government provides us funding for hard commodities, procurement of hard commodities, procurement of vaccines, but operational funds are, are needed as well to move our implementers on the ground. Sufficient supply and logistics. We do have funding, enough funding for the procurement of logistics as well as moving the logistics from the national to the local government units. However, the, the problem here is, the problem here is the arrival or the delivery of the logistics, the timing of the logistics, uh, the timing of the arrival, because we are, we are prevented from speeding up the procurement process because of our law. So these are parts of the challenges that we have to, we have to uh, contend with. Uh, and good governance, lastly, is very essential. I heard Mama a while ago talking about good governance. It's very difficult to explain what good governance is in, in several sentences. But again, I think this, this is very critical in the implementation of a successful immunization program in the country. And uh, lastly, I want to end that immunization has been with us since 1976. We have our successes and now we are looking at downward trend in the coverage. And if we do not re-strategize, I think we will be we will be seeing the same coverage, the same uh, the same coverage, the same outbreaks, disease resurgence will happen if more of the same will still be implemented. So finally, uh, just like what the what Asek uh, Yusek Kabutahe always say more of the same will not produce a different result. So we need the cooperation of all sectors because the Department of Health cannot do it alone. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Silvia, for your very enlightening presentation. What uh, you just have said is something that I think most of us uh, um, are looking forward to know, no? yung sa immunization. Okay, so we now go to the open forum, but before that, allow us to um, thank uh, additional, mem uh, additional media networks who are present with us today. We'd like to thank um, the Daily Tribune, ABS-CBN News, and Today Online. Marami pong salamat sa pagpunta ninyo. Okay, so we now start the open forum. Uh, we will take one question at a time. Uh, when you approach the mic, please state your name and your affiliation. And um, if possible, please make your question concise so we can entertain more questions. Who would like to start? Anyone? Uh, yes, sir, please. Hi, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Alan po from PTV. Ma'am, a specific question for Dr. Uh, Silva? Silva. Yes po. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ma'am, you just mentioned a while ago regarding the target of our government to be the healthiest uh, country among Asian region, I mean, a Asian countries. 
Paano pa mangyayari yun, ma'am? Tapos, uh, with our health problems, uh, ang daming mga issues na lumalabas, may mga Pilipinong may takot na sa vaccinations, mga efforts po ng ating government to resolve the, those. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Silvia, please. It is the vision of the Department of Health to make the Filipinos the healthiest among Asia. Now, how do we do this? Of course, unang-una, kailangan ng operasyon ng lahat. Because the Department of Health cannot do it alone, as I have mentioned earlier. We need also to educate, re-educate all clients or all our kababayan that yung kalusugan is not only the job of the Department of Health. Yes, we are the steward of health, but then the individual has to learn to seek help when something is wrong or even if there is nothing wrong. So we want to uh, emphasize or strengthen the public health system or the primary health care wherein wala pa, no? wala pang nararamdaman, you seek consult check up for the prevention of uh, for the prevention of illness. So that is one of the things that we are hoping to achieve to make every Filipinos be responsible for their own health. And how do we do that? Health literacy. No? Mahirap gawin to change the behavior, the health-seeking behavior of everyone. May mga madaling pumunta sa health center, wala lang nararamdaman. May mga mahirap naman na gustong pupunta na lang sa hospital pag malala na. Because this is usually what's happening. So that is what we want to address first, health literacy. Second, service delivery for all Filipinos. The goal of the universal health care is to provide essential quality health service to all Filipinos. Yes, we will be implementing the universal health care law towards the end of this year in piloted sites or selected sites. But we will be expanding soon. So as I have mentioned earlier, a landmark bill as a... Uh, as, as one of the steps in achieving our goal of making Filipinos healthy by 2022. Thank you very much, ma'am. Other questions? Ah, uh, please. <coughs> Magandang umaga po sa inyo lahat. Kathy Cruz po, uh, mula sa tuklasin natin at uh, sa DZXL ang ating katipunan every Sunday. I'm with Professor um, Antonio Butch Valdez, the former DepEd Undersecretary. Um, medyo na late, actually na late talaga ako. <laughs> Panabutan ko na lang yung kay ma'am. Pero medyo sabihin na natin na, ano, na marami akong katanungan. Tama naman po na Uh, yung tinuran po nung last speaker natin na importante yung tinatawag nating health literacy. And hindi naman din nagkukulang ang ating gobyerno dahil pinipilit na ibigay yung uh, serbisyo. Pero mukhang may nakakalimutan lang tayo na aspeto pagdating sa publiko. Una, dapat isipin natin na yung publiko o ang mamamayang Pilipino ay hindi lang basta kliyente. Tayo ay kapwa pare-parehas Pilipino at ang gobyerno, responsibilidad niya kung nasa lokal man siya o nasa, uh, nasa national government, responsibilidad niya na gawin yung serbisyo. Uh, hindi ito isang negosyo. Okay? Hindi isang kumpanya. Uh, second, um, ang gusto ko lang iputo rito, yung pong health literacy, nagkakaroon po kasi tayo minsan ng problema na Ako, sa, sa senaryo na lang po sa local government, 
meron po tayong health center. Pero madalas, dun sa mga health centers po natin, ang experience o karanasan po ng ating mamayang Pilipino doon, eh pupunta si nanay sa health center madalas at sa maraming ulit, wala pong vaccine. Yung availability ng vaccine na dapat iturok sa tamang oras, sa tamang panahon, hindi nangyayari. Okay? So, gusto ko lang klaruhin, uh, na-check ba natin, is there any monitoring on the side of Department of Health on this aspect? Second, madalas, kahit, si, kahit naman sino, ang mga mga Pilipino, pag may nararamdaman, gusto pumunta agad ng doktor. Ang problema, kakayahan ng marami nating kababayan na pumunta sa doktor, dali isipin kagad niya, imbis na pagpapatingin ko ng dok, ano, babayad ko sa doktor yung 500, sabi na natin 200 siya, ibibili ko na lang ng bigas para sa pamilya. Ang punto ko lang po rito, uh, iniisip po natin yung health literacy, pero hindi rin po natin iniisip, uh, kaya ba ng isang karanawang Pilipino na isustain yung kanyang pangangailangan bilang isang human being. Hindi tayo nagsisimula at nagtatapos dun sa kakain lang tayo ng tatlong beses isang araw. So, tig mukhang kinakailangan, tignan din po natin yung sapat ba yung sinasahod o kinikita ng isang mamayang Pilipino. I don't know who can answer, I don't know who can clarify all those things, pero yan ay tinig ng isang mamayang Pilipino mula sa isang palatuntunan sa amin. Salamat po. Perhaps we can start with uh, Dr. Silva and then uh, the other panelists may, may want to give their uh, insights too. Ma'am? Marami pong salamat. You are very passionate. I am also very passionate in making all Filipinos healthy. Health literacy, you talked about health literacy at yung availability ng mga bakuna sa ating health centers. As I have mentioned, we are procuring enough. But then the challenge is the timing or the arrival of the vaccines as well as the distribution to the implementer level. Sa mga lokal na pamahalaan, sa mga health centers, sa buong bansa ng Pilipinas. We are guided by the procurement law wherein it says that ang default mode of procurement is through public bidding. Now, uh, we start our procurement process ilang buwan bago matapos ang taon for the succeeding year. But because of the problems or challenges in the procurement process, the policy sa pagpoprocure po, doon po tayo natatagalan. And kapag ka Although we have an alternative, pwede po tayong karamihan kasi ng ating mga bakuna ay sinosource out natin. Hindi po karamihan. Lahat po ng ating mga bakuna ay nanggagaling po sa ibang mansa. Dahil wala pong pasilidad dito sa Pilipinas na nagmamanufacture po ng bakuna. So all of our vaccines are imported. If there are suppliers or distributors accredited in the Philippines to supply in the Philippines, yun lang po tayo nagkakaroon ng local procurement. But as I have said, we cannot go directly to an alternative mode of procurement. Ang ginagamit po natin dito is procurement through UNICEF. Na sila po ang ating uh, kinakausap para doon po tayo uh, kumuha or mag-source out ng bakuna. But then, kung tayo po ay nagkaroon na ng ilang failure of bids, tsaka pa lang po tayo na uh, papayagan na dumiretsyo sa UNICEF. And by this time, mga ilang buwan na po ang nakakaraan at naubos na po yung ating uh, uh, buffer stock. Sa gay, uh, ganun pa man po ay sinisiguro po natin na ang atin pong bakuna or ang buffer stock natin sa national level ay sapat para po makover yung mga panahon na nagkakaproblema to po tayo sa procurement. However, marami po kasing mga kadahilanan kung bakit hindi hindi lang po ito ang uh, ang dahilan kung bakit hindi umaabot ng uh, 
ng sa tamang oras yung bakuna natin. One is our distribution process. You know very well that uh, uh, Philippines is archipelagic. No? For Luzon, probably not so much because we have land uh, transportation, but then when you deliver vaccines in the islands of Visayas as well as in Mindanao, wherein may mga iba pa pong mga events na pwedeng mangyari, ito po yung mga challenge po natin. Sa so, ganun naman po, uh, we have instituted reforms in our uh, delivery or distribution process. Dati po ay region lang, Department of Health Regional Offices lang po ang binibigyan namin ng mga direct delivery. But because we realize that mas matatagalan kung sa, sa regional office binabagsak. Kaya ngayon po, every province po sa kabisayaan there na may direct flight po from Manila, ginawan na po namin ng paraan na direct delivery na po, po sila. So, ganito po yung mga inaayos natin because yes, we are monitoring the, the National uh, Expanded Program on Immunization is monitoring the the vaccines, where they are now, ano yung kanilang stock level, and because of this, we came up with several changes in our delivery and in our procurement process. So, sabi ko nga, uh, na parati kong sinasabi sa mga regional managers ng EPI, PDCA lang yan, we plan, we do, we act, we check. Kung nag-work, then we implement, continue to implement our strategy. Kapag ka may uh, problema, binabago po namin. We're very flexible because this uh, data or this uh, ang pagpaplano po namin at uh, pag i strategia ay nababasi po sa resulta ng aming monitoring. Yes, we do monitor. And for I think the poverty side, uh, Somebody has to answer it. <laughs> okay. See, first, may we have have some words from you, Sexa Sendoncillo, to be followed okay. by Ma'am Sel on the poverty aspect. Okay. Mag maganda po yung, yung tanong, no? yung puntong ibinigay. Talagang, given our geographical situation or archipelago, it's a must that we decentralize the system. It decentralized that in system. But of course, there are questions of capacities. But there are always solutions to enhancing capacities. So, tama po yung ginagawa ng DOH. Uh, then it decentralized. But I think it's important also in the future, way forward po, Doc, Dr. Silva, maybe we already have to really uh, empower our local governments, define the service standards, help them comply with the service standards, and then eventually, sila na talaga ang magdi-deliver ng service. Kasi right now, talaga ang kulang yun. But I would like to, to provide an insight on how do we improve the health of people. I th I'm not a doctor, but I'm a mother and a wife. Health starts at home. Doon talaga nagsisimula. In, in the past few years that I have been observing communities and dealing with local governments, mayroon tayong isang malaking challenge na hinaharap. And this is citizenship. Saan nagsisimula ang lahat? Sa citizenship. For example, if you are a responsible citizen, a responsible mother, you take care of the health of your children. Hindi natin inaasa, inaasa lang lagi sa pamahalaan. Even simple things as ensuring sanitation of the home. Saan nang gagaling yung mga lamok na yun? Okay. Do you have to go to government to clean your home? Hindi. But we have imbibed that culture. Some probably would disagree with me. But we have imbibed that culture of entitlement. We always look up to government to give everything we need. And we have failed to look at 
our own responsibilities as citizens. Yung siguro ang kailangan ibalansin natin. Citizenship in the Philippines, from my perspective, has been going down. That's why we see a lot of apathy. Nakatingin lahat sa pamahalaan. Pwede naman siyang gumawa ng action para sa sarili niya. Health, as I said, health investments starts at home with the families. Among poor people, mag-obserbahan din ninyo, when we did the MDG phases in the cities, there was one behavior that, that we observed. Kaya mababa yung level of MDGs at that time was families do not bother about their MDG levels. I, I had witnessed one discussion in Surigao City where we had the families among poor people in the city gathered together to do their analysis of their SDGs and do a family commitment. Alam niyo sa isang pamilya, ang tanong, magkano ang kinikita ng pamilya? Si tatay nagtatay si Kad, 150 a day. Si nanay naglalaba, another 150, 300. Ang sunod na tanong, saan napupunta yung 300 na kinikita? Alam niyo po, you'd be surprised. Saan napupunta? Part of it goes to the cigarette and the liquor of tatay every day. A part of it goes to wedding. So a little part goes to the basic needs of the family. You see? That's responsibility. Kailangan talaga, if we go into literacy, we have to emphasize that citizenship responsibility. Hindi na yung pananaw na lahat ng problema, I can create my problems, but I go to government for solution to my problems. Yun siguro ang kailangan nating baguhin na pananaw. I'm not finding an excuse for government. Kasi talagang nandoon kailangan ang government. But government cannot do that alone without responsible citizenship. As simple as health responsibility. So yun siguro ang pating ka rin natin. And I, I'm happy that the media is here because you can play that major role of educating our citizens. Be responsible citizens. Participate in governance and development. Medyo, kahit basura, makikita nyo naman, no? In Metro Manila. People just don't care. Kakain, lalagay lang ang basura kung saan-saan. Because they are expecting government to pick it up for them. Diba? Ganun ang ginagawa natin. How do we define cleanliness these days? Pag lumabas ang basura sa bakura na I'm clean, let government handle it. Is that good citizenship? No. We're not helping our government. Ano ang ating advocacy ngayon? Governance. Hindi lang pamahalaan, kundi pamamahala. And that would entail citizenship into governance. Maraming salamat, Yusek. Ma'am Sel, on the just property very, aspect. Just very quickly, no, yung observation na, yun na nga kung medyo um, mahirap ka at uh, pagpipilian mo ay pagkain or magpapatingin ka. Tama yun na um, nakikita din nating obserbasyon na mas gagamitin nila yung pera nila para sa pagkain. Kaya napakahalaga na um, merong adequate services, health services at the local level. And ganun naman yung ginagawa ng pamahalaan. So even at the barangay level, uh, meron tayong mga health centers. Although, ina-admit naman ng government na meron pang areas for improvement. But Sabi nga siguro yung pagtutulungan din na um, and greater siguro coordination and um, probably um, uh, whole of uh, <laughs> government approach kasi nga yung nakikita nating some of the gaps could actually be resolved by better coordination siguro kasi um, hindi naman lahat may bibigay ng national government involved na tayo at the same time hindi rin kaya ng lahat ng LGUs na ma-provide lahat yung services. So, dun siguro papasok yung um, greater coordination. But I would agree with you, Sek, na talagang importante din na ma-emphasize yung role ng citizens in all of, in addressing all of these challenges. Hindi lang siguro palaging um, government. Uh, not just in the area of health, but in all of the, na, napakita kanina in all of the presentations, na importante talaga yung uh, lahat tayo ay um, magtulong-tulong para, para ma um, 
ma-navigate natin yung new globalization. Thank you, ma'am. May we have the next question, please? Hi, uh, good morning po. I'm Bruce Rodriguez from ABS-CBN News. Uh, maybe um, my questions can be answered by Dr. Bionis and Ms. Akia from ano, uh, DTI. Uh, it's about, it's always, it's been repeatedly said that we, we, we may be able to benefit from the, uh, the trade war that's happening right now. And as we see it really persisting, what could be, uh, I guess, uh, our, uh, probably a low-hanging fruit for the Philippines to focus on so that we can really uh, benefit from this shifting trade dynamics, global trade dynamics. And second, we're also seeing, uh, we're, s we're also having some local challenges. Um, so maybe to focus more on the local actions, we might need to f uh, uh, address some local issues as well, including, again, uh, we're talking about a possible delay in the national budget again. Was this really a big factor in the slowing economy this year? And what could happen next year? Because of course, hopefully not. But if we do operate on a reenacted budget again next year, and uh, we see s growth slowing again, then that may that might mean that it's not really the budget that's at fault with the slowing growth. Thank you. Thank you. So the lady first, Miss Akia. Um, thank you for your question. In terms of yung sa low hanging uh, that we can do, what we're doing now at the DTI is we're trying to find different markets for our products. We're, we're not just concentrating on the U.S. and China because I think many of you have heard yung parang expression that if uh, China sneezes or the U.S. sneezes, the rest of the world will catch a cold or, or a cough or whatever. So it, it's really true because uh, most of our exports go to this market. So what we're doing is we're trying to tap other markets. Uh, we're looking to the European side. Uh, we're also uh, uh, um, strengthening our uh, cooperation with our neighbors, the ASEAN, even though they are competitors, they are also our partners. Uh, but, uh, so we're trying to co complete the negotiations on the RCEP. On the European side, we just uh, concluded negotiations with the EFTA countries that covers Norway, Sweden, Liechtenstein, and Switzerland. So ito yung, this is what the government is doing. Um, uh, in terms of other uh, things that we can do, I mentioned already yung sa trabaho bill, that has to pass because it will certainly provide business confidence. Um, we cannot compete with the subsidies and also the different uh, um, investment opportunities by our neighbors, including Th uh, Thailand and uh, Vietnam. But if we are able to pass itong sa trabaho bill, uh, which will certainly do a long way in terms of providing certain incentives to um, to uh, corporate uh, and also lowering corporate tax, it will help us uh, invite more investments and more investors into the country. So that would be. Thank you, Ms. Akia. Dr. Briones, your response to the same questions, please. Yeah, on the wider theme of uh, export opportunities uh, and, uh, and boosting these for Filipino MSMEs, let me highlight agriculture. Uh, Philippines has fallen way, way behind our ASEAN, uh, ASEAN neighbors even in terms of exports of agricultural products. So uh, although this is uh, not a very big share of that 86 billion, but if you consider Thailand, uh, 40 billion immediately of their exports, 40 plus billion are uh, agricultural or food-based exports. Uh, Philippines barely cracked seven or eight billion uh, in, th in this category. There's also a big opportunity for um, micro, small and medium, well, especially small and medium enterprises to break through in foreign markets. It's not easy to imagine, say, a uh, small small or medium enterprise in breaking big in automotives but they might be able to make it big in some food product. Although, un unfortunately, uh, a lot of them have difficulty. And usually our exporters are the big agribusiness companies. So our new uh, Secretary of Department of Agriculture has made it uh, his platform, uh, competitiveness. So uh, I hope that he will be able to institute good programs. Now, that's not only DA uh, problem. It's, as mentioned earlier, it's a whole of government thing. 
For instance, one of the things na, if I may highlight DOH, one of the uh, keys to be able to unlock foreign markets is to get some formal certification of food safety. And that's a DOH function. Uh, with the ease of doing business, I understand that uh, many measures are now being put in place to try to follow, comply with the timelines stated in that law within the DOH. Thank you, Ruel. Yes, ma'am. Next question. Hello po. Uh, good morning. Uh, for, for Dr. Bionis. Ma'am, may I have your, uh, yes. have your name? Yes, Tim Gonzalez po from today online. My question would be uh, regarding dun sa tinura nyo about globalization. Uh, uh, regarding po sa, sa, sa with our national budget, how much percent is is our budget going to PIDs, to Philippine? <laughs> 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 Ah, okay, Papa. All right. So, okay. Napagit yun po yung ano no industrial port revolution no. Ano po bang ginagawa na base po sa studies nyo? Ano po bang ginagawa natin regarding dun sa up upgrading of our skills para sa mga sa mga bagong teknolohiyang ito? Meron po ba kayong pag-aaral regarding? Ah, hirap magtagal. Okay. Uh since you directed the question to me, let me have a first crack. But I will field your question as well to our president because mas malawak ang <laughs> saklaw niyang kalaman. I'm relatively uh, specialized agricultural policy. But uh, offhand, I can tell you that yes, uh, government is, uh, uh, in fact, through forums like this and uh, efforts within the DOLE uh, and other related agencies, DTI also, uh, and DepEd also uh, trying and TESDA to try to move things along and confront the challenges of fourth industrial revolution. Kasi yung mga dating revolution parang nagulat na lang tayo, di ba? This time, ayaw na natin yun. Uunahan na natin. Kahit malayo pa, napaka high tech naman yan. Huwag natin pairalin yung pananaw na yun. Kasi kung pairalin natin yun, mabubulagaan na naman tayo. Siguro, um, dagdag ko lang, no? yun actually yung isa sa um, siguro layunin ng PIDS. No? Parang bago pa dumating yung um, malaking problema, aware na tayo at prepared na tayo. And that's why um, since last year, we've been focusing on uh, emerging um, issues. So last year, we focused on the fourth industrial revolution. And this year, we're focusing on the new globalization. So on the four, ang, ang strategy ngayon ng PIDS is we, we're doing some work related already to the themes. But we continue to work on the themes even after the annual public policy conference. So with regards to the fourth industrial revolution, tuloy-tuloy yung pag-aaral namin na tinitingnan namin tama ba yung, for instance, we're looking at TESDA, ano ba yung mga in-offer na courses, are these going to be relevant in the context of the fourth industrial revolution? Tinitingnan din, sabi din natin na with the fourth industrial revolution, yung future of work will change. So uh, ano na yung mga magiging uh, trabaho, um, so we have uh, ongoing studies on online work kasi nga uh, hindi na yung dating 8 to 5 ka pagpunta ka sa opisina, ganito yung klase ng trabaho mo. Pero ngayon makikita natin na with all of these changes, pwede nang nasa bahay yung nanay, nagtatrabaho ng apat na oras lang, tapos mag-aalaga uli siya, maglalaba, magluluto, tapos natrabaho uli. Uh, hindi lang yung nanay, but kahit yung tatay din. So nag-iiba na, nag na yung ating um, definition ng, ng work. So, tuloy-tuloy yung pag-aaral na ginagawa ng PIDS. And in relation naman to, to this, meron din tayong um, mga pag-aaral related to all of this. You will notice na actually, dun sa program namin ay apat na major themes. Um, isa yung sa public, yung health issues, uh, yung trade, yung inequality, at saka yung trust and social cohesion. And we have ongoing work on this as well as may future work na nakaline up. And if you have specific um, questions also on trade. Nandito din yung aming expert on trade, si Francis, uh, who can also answer some of some of the questions. Thank you very much. May we have the next question, please? Hi, Bim Santos from TV5. Uh, I was hoping Dr. Reyes and Dr. Bonus will take a stab at this issue, considering the topic of the press conference. Uh, they say na in globalization, one of the effects is yung uh, easier access to credit markets and which results to some economies being highly leveraged. So I was wondering if, uh, what's your take on the 
uh, the, the national government's uh, debt level, considering that by next year it's projected to uh, to hit about eight trillion. Is this okay? Is this some? Is this a cause for concern? Or what's your What's your perspective on this? Thank you. For the debt level, I think uh, aside from the absolute number of the debt, the size of the debt, we have to uh, consider it in ratio to the GDP, because GDP is the wherewithal. If you can tax that GDP, and you can use it to service the debt. So uh, I think in terms of uh, in ratio to GDP, since we're growing at late 5 or early 6%, then we can tolerate also uh, increases in the position of our, uh, or increases in the national government debt. I think our economic managers are keeping it within reasonable limits. Let, let me just add, uh, what's also important to note is how this um, debt proceeds are, are being used. And so we, we actually need a lot of resources to upgrade our infrastructure to be able to um, participate in these global value chains, to be able to uh, address some of our health concerns, to be able to um, really take part in this um, new globalization. So the fact that government is focusing on um, infrastructure through its build, build, build program, um, we expect that this would generate um, economic, uh, this would generate revenues that would allow us to repay um, these loans. You have a follow-up question? A quick follow-up lang po. Yung sa earlier question ko as well. Uh, just about the national budget again. On how important is it really? Yeah, to, uh, so that we can maybe, of course, fund all these uh, programs that you're, uh, that you that we've all been hearing just today. Thank you. Maybe for uh, anyone can answer. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. The Director General Golding of the Senate Economic Planning Office is here. May we hear your um, insights, uh, DG Golding? <laughs> Timely question. <laughs> well, the um, budget kasi natin ay ng DBC, si composed of uh, economic managers. So, tama ang sabi ni, ni President Reyes na ang pag-grow ng economy natin, economy natin ay tama lang na pagkunan ng revenue sa pagtaas ng ating pangungutang at ang pangungutang natin ay magagamit sa isang uh, productive na na, na pro, pro, proyekto para sa kapakanan ng lahat. So, yun lang. Thank you, DG Golding. May gusto kang idagdag, Groel? Yeah, I think sa pag-aaral ng NEDA, uh, it would seem that the problem is um, uh, a lot of the construction companies Kumbaga, nakaabang siya doon sa i release na budget. So if you don't release your budget in time, the contracts don't get signed in time, the releases. So all of that is kept idle. Uh, and it's unpredictable. You don't know na baka naman bukas. So you cannot release that. So pawin mo yung mga workers mo, di ba? At maghanap sila ng ibang trabaho. Hindi eh. Ay, baka, baka bukas, i-release na yung pera. So all of this uncertainty is really contributing, I believe, in a slowdown. Now, you don't want to make that a normal state of affairs. So maganding na propose mo. Let's run a natural experiment. Let's pass the budget in time. <laughs> and then maybe see if indeed the growth will pick up next year. DG Golding has something to add. Uh, may isususugla ako from an insider point of view. Mukhang wala na namang reenactment this time. So kasi yung leadership ng, ng House at ng Senate ay nag-uusap tungkol dito at ang... Even the uh, chair chairman of the Committee on Finance the Senate and the uh, chairman of the Committee on Appropriations House make closer uh, relationship ngayon. At uh, siguro naman, medyo maganda yung leadership ng House at saka ang Senate naman hindi na magbago. So most likely, walang reenactment. Okay. Thank you for that uh, valuable information, sir. <laughs> May we have the next... Ay, Ma'am Sel, would you like to add something? Okay. May we have the next question, please? Hi, sir. Uh, Ma'am, good morning. Good afternoon, sorry. Um, to Dr. Briones. Sir, um, and also to, to DTI, with globalization, there will be losers and winners. So are there certain sectors that should be warned that you need to, um, you need to make in innovations you need to change 
and uh, what are these sectors and what can they do if you can identify probably three, five sectors. And then for the winners, um, how can you uh, sustain the momentum or that globalization can provide you? Thank you. I think it's directed to you, but of course, Ms. Akia can also give her insights. Um, I'd rather focus on the winners. It's hard to say losers because that creates, a, you know, if somebody picks it up, tapos narinig nila na loser yung sector nila patay, di ba? Sisisihin pa kami. But um, just focusing on the winners. And I appreciate that we have a wide spectrum of agencies here. We have health. We have local government. And there is this... Uh, idea that you know trade uh, indirectly directly affects health and other way around so healthy economy healthy people and I say this because in services that's a very important sector for us right now I think that is a very competitive area for the Philippines we have educated English speaking uh, people we are in that demo graphic sweet spot they say yung talagang uh, that age na maraming workers so ito yung area na gusto talaga din namin i-develop and what uh, I just want to make a plug yung project ng DTI called the QBO Innovation Hub this is a public private initiative uh, of startups uh, set up by the DTI the Department of Science and Technology Idea Space and JP Morgan and we offer classes, workshops, uh, feedback session to give uh, to consult on legal accounting, marketing, cor uh, corporate government partner referrals for our startups and innovators. I think this one area of services that we have to continue to uh, support at the at the department, and then of course, meron pa yung iba pang mga services sectors uh, that we should continue to give support to. It, this is an area where we can really excel as a country in the services trade. Thank you very much, Lynn. Pangalanan ko na. Agriculture uh, will be hard hit. Right now, they're protected by very high tariff ro uh, walls. Even rice, which we had recently liberalized, still being protected by 35% tariff wall. Now, uh, it's being mentioned that rice is kind of a cautionary tale, although it's, I would rather say that tale is too early to tell. It, we're just a few months off the implementation of the Liberalization Act. So a lot of the dust is still settling. Kaya lang, we're, while that dust is settling, di pa, nakalutang pa lang, we're drawing conclusions na. I think it's, it's kind of premature. Nonetheless, uh, it, it, it is already being seen by sugar industry. Kasi there are some ideas floating around, uh, and even the new DA secretary welcomed the idea of opening up a sugar sector para naman maservisyuhan, bumaba naman yung cost of doing business ng ano ng uh, food manufacturing, a lot of whom draw sugar. And then they have to pay like uh, 50 to 100 percent more for their sugar. They had to sila compared to competitors in Thailand, uh, in, in, uh, in, in other countries, in Vietnam. So uh, what's the formula? I think giving access to users to the, the most cost effective uh, sources that's really important for economic efficiency at the same time, based on the uh, method followed by the uh, Agricultural Competitiveness, sorry, uh, uh, Agriculture Tarification Act and then this latest Rice Liberalization Act, you also program uh, pro uh, safety nets for the adversely affected sectors. Certainly, this cannot be ignored. Uh, we, we anticipate already that they will be on the receiving end of uh, more cost-effective imports. So, tulungan na natin sila na to match the cost of production, uh, remain competitive, or even explore opportun livelihood opportunities kung saan sila mas lalong kikita. Okay, additional questions from our media participants? Okay, if there is none, allow me to read a uh, question which we received uh, from our um, w from one of our Facebook Facebook viewers, and this is for Dr. Silva. 
You presented the declining trend in people's trust in vaccines. What is DOH doing to gain back public's trust in the safety and effectiveness of vaccines? Ma'am, please. The Department of Health is uh, upping its campaign in providing the correct information. Uh, because, uh, as I have said, vaccination is a victim of its own success. We haven't been very visible. Uh, we have no uh, updates on the, the, the public safety, the, the safety as well as the efficacy of vaccines. Uh, this has been uh, implemented since 1976, and this is routinely given to all infants. So uh, before, when uh, we were very successful in providing universal vaccination to infants, we thought that there is no need really to uh, announce this. But then because there is a declining, uh, especially when uh, after the Dengvaxia controversy erupted, then we really have to, uh, you know, debunk all the misinformation, the fake news that circulated, uh, especially in social media. We have to uh, get the support from the private sector. We have to... Uh, rally the the immunization champions uh, the private physicians the experts uh, to uh, really come up uh, and come out and uh, uh, prove that uh, indeed vaccines are safe and vaccines are effective we did uh, have several risk communication plans our Health Promotion and uh, Education Bureau of the Department of Health has been going around the country doing focus group discussion and re-educating people, uh, reorienting them. Because first things first, they have to unlearn the misconception that has been wildly, widely circulating and to learn the facts about vaccination. As I have said, it's Health Literacy 101 once again, and we started with that. Thank you very much, Dr. Silva. Okay, so on that note, please join me in thanking our uh, panelists for their comprehensive and uh, thought-provoking presentations and insights. At marami din pong salamat sa lahat ng nandito ngayon, sa members ng press, sa pagpunta niyo dito at also sa members ng DPRM Steering Committee. Before we close, allow me to um, remind everyone, this serves as a gentle reminder as well as an invitation to all of you to the remaining activities this September in celebration of the Development Policy Research Month. As mentioned by Dr. Reyes, we will have next week a forum in General Santos City uh, that's uh, the fifth Mindanao Policy Research Forum on the theme navigating the challenges of the new globalization local actions for Mindanao. Kung hindi po kayo makakapunta sa Jensen, um, live stream po ito sa ating Facebook account, sa Facebook account po ng PIDS. And uh, secondly, the main and culminating activity of uh, the DPRM 2019, that's the annual public policy conference on the theme, of course, navigating the new globalization, local actions for global challenges. We'll, we will be holding this at the Sofitel Philippine Plaza, Manila on September 19. So yun po. Um, for more details about DPRM and the annual public policy conference, just um, visit our um, conference website at uh, appc.pids.gov.ph and the DPRM website at dprm.pids.gov.ph. Okay, um, yun din pong mga evaluation forms natin. Baka po pwedeng pakisagutan. Uh, important po sa amin na marinig ang inyong feedback so we can deliver more effective services to all of you. So, this concludes our uh, DPRM 2019 press conference. Marami pong salamat sa inyong lahat. 
at uh, inaasahan po namin ang inyong participation sa aming mga iba pang activities sa DPRM at iba pang activities ng PIDS. Magandang tanghali po. Everyone is invited to uh, lunch. Pagpumuna kayong aalis. Lahat po ay imbitado. Thank you.